Orlando, uh, talking about some of the work uh, in our lab profiling microbial communities from shotgun sequencing data. And we'll be talking about some recent advancements in that area today. Uh, so when we're talking about the uh, microbial community, there's two primary questions or types of questions we're trying to answer from sequencing data. One is this question of who is there, uh, which is the issue of taxonomic profiling, of identifying the species and higher level clades that are present in that microbial community. Uh, and the second question, which will be the uh, closer focus for today, is a question of what those species are doing, which is functional profiling, identifying the gene families and pathway composition of that community. Uh, and both of these, because they're starting from sequence data, are classic bioinformatics problems in, in sequence search. So that's where we begin our story. Um, so to actually do this, to actually do either of these types of profiling, we're interested in searching short reads, a shotgun sequence metagenome or metatranscriptome, against a vast database of microbial reference genomes. And as you can imagine, as the size of these data, uh, uh, metagenomes increases, as the size of this database increases with new isolate genomes being sequenced every year, this is a very computationally intensive problem. Uh, and there's also a lot of opportunity for error here if we're spuriously mapping reads where they don't belong. And so this is really where we find ourselves in trying to solve these profiling questions. Previously, we developed a technique uh, for taxonomic profiling to alleviate some of those issues. And more specifically, what we're doing there in this tool called Metaflan2 is instead of searching reads against an, the entire database, is to search them against a pre-selected set of marker genes that are unique for each clade or species uh, across the community. So for example, here we have, I've isolated this A gene here that's uh, well conserved within the yellow species. We always see it in isolates of that species but it's not seen anywhere else. So if that gene recruits a read, if a read maps to that gene in the community, it's sort of like a little name tag telling us that the yellow species is there. Uh, and we can use this technique to very efficiently and accurately profile the taxonomic composition of a community. This is a reduced database, so it gives us a nice speed uh, bonus. And we've also pre-selected these genes to be very specific, so we know when they recruit reads that, we're, um, that they're uh, being assigned at the correct place. The issue in, tax and, in uh, functional profiling is we're not interested in just a subset of genes, but rather we're interested in all the genes and pathways in the community. Um, but in today's talk, what I would like to, to, to go over is how we can leverage this idea of being able to rapidly and accurately identify the species in a community in order to improve the accuracy, uh, speed, and resolution of functional profiling. So the method that we developed for that is called HUMAN2, and it implements a strategy called tiered read mapping, and I'll go through what that means now. So the idea here is that we're starting from a shotgun sequenced metagenome or metatranscriptome from a microbial community. And then we're going to search these reads through a set of, of tiers, of different searches against different databases. The first search tier is what I just described in the previous slide. We're going to attempt to rapidly identify the species in this community by mapping these reads against the small and highly specific data set of species-specific marker genes. And so you can see here in this example that genes are being recruited to this marker gene from the blue species and the orange species here, indicating that they are likely to be present in this community, but not to this green species, indicating that it's likely absent from that community. And this is our first search tier. The second search tier, which is really the meat of this whole process then, is to build a custom database for this sample by concatenating the pangenomes of species that we detected in this taxonomic pre-screen step. So now what we're going to do is do a detailed search of all the remaining reads against the genomes or pangenomes of species we believe to be present in the community. We're throwing away this genome here. We're not including this genome here because we had no uh, evidence that it was actually present in the community. And although I'm just showing one here being excluded, in reality, this process is excluding many, many pangenomes that we won't search through in this second tier of the search. In the last tier of the search, anything that doesn't map in this process will then let flow into a more traditional comprehensive search strategy. So we'll try to explain as much as we can as quickly and as specifically as possible, and then what's left over will take a, a, a traditional approach and just search comprehensively by translated search against a, a protein database. At the very end of this, some reads will still map nowhere. They don't map to any reference, and these are set aside for possible assemb assembly downstream and outside of human too. So the end result of this tiered search are, are functional profiles of a metagenome or metatranscriptome, looking something like this where we have a particular function, in this case a, a gene family, and it's stratified 
by both contributing organism as well as unclassified abundance that we couldn't assign to a particular species that adds up to a, a total here. This is for gene families. Once we've actually quantified the gene families in the community, uh, for genes like IMP dehydrogenase that participate in a metabolic pathway, we can collapse the abundance of multiple genes into a smaller subset of pathways, which is um, uh, more tractable to work with downstream. And we end up with similar looking data where we get for each pathway, an abundance at the community level, as well as stratified by the species that contributed to that pathway, and a measure of pathway coverage, which is a, a measure of our confidence that the pathway is actually complete within this particular sample. So these are what the outputs look like uh, for a typical run of human 2 on a metagenome or metatranscriptome. Um, to evaluate that this actually works and behaving the way that we expect it to, we were able to create synthetic metagenomes or metatranscriptomes by taking sets of bacterial genomes and pulling synthetic sequencing reads from them. Uh, and so in the example I'll go over here, we have a, a selection of 20 bacterial species that are the most commonly occurring species in the human gut microbiome. Uh, and what we've done is to sample reads, I think the color there just shifted if there's anything we're able to do with that on the projector. If not, you can adjust your eyes. Um, so we have sampled these reads in a staggered composition here, such that the most uh, abundant uh, species in this uh, synthetic metagenome is about a thousand times more abundant than the least abundant species. And so this makes for a challenging uh, problem here in that the species have a really broad range of uh, abundance brilliance. Uh, also, you can see challenging us here the fact that we have congeneric species, multiple species within the same genus. And so there's a lot of homology we expect among these congeneric species, which can make mapping reads to specific species within that genus more difficult. So once we have this synthetic metagenome, we can create an expected profile of what genes and pathways we expect to observe, and then analyze this metagenome using different methods and see how well they do. When we actually analyze this using a traditional method, a traditional comprehensive search, uh, we actually see a lot of error due to spurious mapping. We have reads that are mapping where they're not supposed to across those broad databases, which hurts our precision, as well as reads that were supposed to map to a gene and wound up mapping somewhere else, which hurts our sensitivity. Uh, in contrast, human 2's tiered search is both more specific uh, and more uh, uh, sensitive in terms of putting reads in the right place, which gives us a nice boost in overall accuracy. Uh, in addition, because the tiered search is trying to explain as much as possible using that reduced pangenome database, it tends to process the metagenome a lot faster than the comprehensive search. You're, you're spending more time working with a small database than you are the large database with the tiered search. Uh, and so in this particular synthetic example, it was about a 7x speed up. Uh, but the last thing, which is really one of the key advantages of, of Human2 here, is that in addition to getting us to community totals of different functions, which both methods can do, Human 2's tiered search is able to reconstruct functions on a species-by-species -species basis within the community. And what we can see here is our sensitivity for those functions across species is very, very high, down to about 1x coverage. Once we get below 1x coverage, you're actually not sampling the entire genome anymore. And so, you, you're, while the gold standard says you should be able to find everything, because reads weren't necessarily sampled from every gene, we don't see them. However, it's critical to note that our precision remains very high even for these low abundance species, meaning that their genomes are in this database, they're in this custom database, um, but they're not recruiting reads that they're not supposed to. So we were very happy with the overall performance of the method here. Uh, in terms of performance on real world data, we've used Human2 to profile hundreds of human metagenomes from the Human Microbiome Project. And there we tend to see similar performance that uh, we're able to move very quickly through these metagenomes in the pangenome search stage about an order to two orders of magnitude faster than in the translated search. Now that doesn't work that well for us if we don't end up explaining a lot of reads in pangenome search. And indeed what we find is that up to about 60% of reads in a typical metagenome are explained by the pangenome mapping during that fast step with about 15% of additional reads explained when we then uh, take the rest of the reads and push them through pangenomes, uh, translated search. So we're really explaining the majority of what we can explain during this accelerated uh, initial tier of the, the search. So that's, that's some benchmarking and uh, accuracy stats for you. Moving into some actual science, we've then looked at the profiles that Human2 produced uh, from those HMP metagenomes, and we've isolated metabolic pathways that we call signatures for particular body areas meaning that they're really well conserved within a particular body area and tend to be absent from other body areas. 
So in this example at the top, Romnose degradation, we see that it's quite abundant and conserved at the, in gut metagenomes across individuals Ooh. and fairly rare at these three other mi uh, uh, microbiome body sites. So this is sort of a, a, a grand overview. If we zoom in on that top example here to see how this looks sample by sample, we can see that indeed HUMAN2 is showing us a lot of very consistent abundance for this pathway of about six parts per thousand across the gut metagenomes, and then it drops off very quickly thereafter, that we don't really see much abundance for this pathways at the other uh, sites. Uh, in addition, this is a little tricky to see here, but this light gray down here is the unclassified amount of the, uh, the pathway that's uh, identified during the translated search. The rest of this in darker gray out, outside that box is actually being assigned a particular species. So in, in this particular example, not only are we seeing this pathway consistently across gut metagenomes, but we're able to assign it uh, assign the majority of the copies of that pathway to particular species. And when we actually take those signature pathways and dig into that species level attribution, we see some interesting mm -hmm. patterns. So for example, if we zoom in on what's going on in that little box there for the gut metagenomes and, and take a look at the species attribution, uh, we can see different patterns of how species contribute to a conserved pathway or how a pathway is conserved across different individuals. In the case of this gut uh, pathway, Romnos uh, degradation, the attribution is actually relatively complex, that although the total is fairly well conserved across individuals, we see very different uh, mixtures of species contributing the pathway from one person to another. Uh, most individuals have a, a handful of species that are contributing, and those aren't necessarily the same from one person to the next, suggesting that the overall abundance of this pathway mm -hmm. seems to be more conserved than its taxonomic attribution. Uh, contrast that with another mechanism where we can observe a per-person dominant attribution of the pathway. Uh, so for example, this is peptidoglycan biosynthesis from the vaginal microbiome. Here again, we see a relatively constant abundance across individuals, but a very different pattern of attribution, that each individual is dominated by about one species, uh, mostly in the, the genus Lactobacillus. And so while they all wind up with about the same abundance of the pathway, it tends to be contributed by just one uh, species per person that may differ between people. A last mechanism is a universal dominant pattern of attribution. And an example of this is trehalose degradation on the skin. Uh, this is a pathway that's provided by Propionobacterium acnes. It's not really seen uh, at other body sites. And on the skin, this pathway is fairly consistently and um, completely provided by just Propionobacterium acnes across the population. So unlike the previous two examples where different species could contribute the pathway in different mixtures, here on the skin, we're really just seeing this one very common skin bug, prop acne, contributing this uh, signature pathway for the skin across individuals. And so HUMAN2's tiered search combined with the species level profiling allows us to see this sort of taxonomic resolution to function uh, that we haven't been able to do in previous approaches. As a final biological example, we'll move outside of the Human Microbiome Project to another uh, cohort that uh, two of my colleagues, Jason and Galab, work on. Uh, this is a cohort of health professionals within the Boston area where we have both uh, metagenomes and metatranscriptomes uh, of the human gut. And Jason and Elite have profiled these samples using HUMAN2. Um, and when we look at the DNA level contributions for, for pathways in this uh, group, we see a lot of things that are similar to that first mechanism I showed, a complex attribution where a particular pathway is relatively conserved in the gut but can be contributed by multiple organisms per person, and those potentially differ between people. So this is looking at the, the DNA level. We see that this is also a fairly uh, conserved pattern between individuals of, of this mixture of bugs. When we look at the RNA data, however, we see a very different picture, that there's more of a gradient of some people having a, a complex attribution pattern in the RNA pool, whereas in others, the RNA pool is completely dominated by a single species, Fecalobacterium cosnitsii. And so here, what we're seeing from HUMAN2 is this ability to distinguish the functional potential of a community, in this case, uh, numbers or relative copy numbers of encoded pathways across bugs, uh, with functional activity, the actual relative expression of that, uh, that pathway within a community, and see that the two are not always the same. Uh, so in summary, uh, HUMAN2 implements this tiered approach, which is a new approach to functional profiling that aims to explain as many reads as possible with progressively um, broader and less specific databases. Uh, this approach is more accurate and a lot faster than the traditional approach of just doing a comprehensive search against an exhaustive database. 
Uh, and lastly, we get stratification of our results uh, by species for free in this process, which allows us to access both those questions of who's there uh, and what they're doing at the same time, uh, which is increasingly what we want to know, not just what a community is doing, uh, but what species are actually performing those functions in the community. Human 2 is available now, if this is something that's of interest to you. It's the first hit if you Google Human 2. Um, uh, it's installable via source uh, pip as a Python package and uh, via homebrew. Uh, we have a fairly detailed user manual as well as a very active uh, user group on Google Groups um, where you and I can converse by email if you'd like. <laughs> um, and so I'd encourage you to try it out. Uh, Human 2 is part of a broader menagerie of tools that, that the Huttenhauer Lab has put together for analyzing microbiomes, both in terms of profiling data, uh, profiling metagenomes from raw sequencing, as well as doing downstream statistical analysis on those results. If you'd like to learn more about that overall system, we'll be doing a technology track presentation tomorrow evening that will give more of a, a broader survey of, of these tools than I've done now. Uh, and also, if you stay tuned, my colleague Ali will be presenting one of our statistical methods for the analysis of paired high-dimensional data sets. Uh, so a big thanks to the lab, especially the Human 2 team highlighted there in green for, for um, having a lot of fun with this project. Uh, our collaborators on Human 2 and uh, also the entire Human Microbiome Project for providing a lot of excellent data for us to work with. Thank you.